good evening. Welcome to House Baptist Church. Let's stand and sing together. It's in the solid rock. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. See, last verse. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand standing on the promises of christ my king through eternal ages let his praises ring glory in the highest i will shout and sing standing on the promises of god standing 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 on the promises of God my Savior standing standing I'm standing on the promises of God standing on the promises I cannot fail when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail by the living word of God I shall prevail Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing, standing I'm standing on the promises of God on the promises I cannot fall listening every moment to the Spirit's call resting in my Savior as my all in all standing on the promises of God standing 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 on the promises of God my Savior standing Standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Amen. It's good to see you out this evening. I hope and trust you've had a, had a good week so far. And maybe you're like me, you got a little too much sun. Anybody else get a little too much sun? And on the sunscreen on, that's an afterthought most of the time. But uh, good to see each out uh, this evening. Had a great day uh, in the Lord's house Sunday. I'll tell you more about that in just a moment. Any first time guests or visitors this evening? Anybody? First time Guest or visitor? All right. Well, let's go, Lord, in prayer. Uh, good to see uh, Don Kelly back in uh, in, in town here. Is uh, uh, being prayer. His uh, uh, father passed away there uh, just recently and was out of town with that. And so it's good to have you back tonight, Don. We love you, brother. Would you open us up in a word of prayer tonight? Amen. You may be seated this evening. If I can give you an update there from, from Sunday, uh, had, a, had a good 
good crowd turnout all day Sunday, even if it was Memorial Day weekend, and uh, then Sunday night had a great uh, fellowship. Uh, wasn't the worship singing great Sunday night? Uh, folks just did a, a tremendous job. Uh, had uh, some some newer folks sing there as well. They all did a great job. Most importantly, though, there was uh, Sunday night. We had a gentleman uh, visiting. His uh, wife and, and kids have been coming. They had just recently given their lives to Christ here just in the last few months, and uh, he just had knee, uh, knee surgery here, reconstructive knee surgery recently. Uh, came visit his son and night, shot his arm up. Uh, he needed to get saved, and sure enough, he walked forward and, and got saved. So it was a great, great, uh, great night for, for that. His name was Stacy Williams. So be in prayer for the Williams family and thanking the Lord for that. Just a few announcements here this evening, uh, just to keep you up to date with things going on. Uh, this uh, Tomorrow, the uh, teens are having a, uh, an acting out in the Book of Acts uh, time then from 9 to noon. Uh, this Saturday's men's prayer breakfast at 9 a.m., followed by our outreach and visitation. And then Sunday, we launch into the month of June on our Sunday services there. Uh, Genesis series will continue um, in morning and evening. Also, the uh, Fuel Camp, we're having a, a meeting there for the parents and, and teens uh, to, uh, at 10 o'clock in the youth in the uh, uh, Fellowship Hall game room downstairs. So uh, anyone that's got any teens going to camp, uh, plan to, to make your way down there to, to Sunday school and they'll be going over all things camp-related. And praise God, there is such a huge group going. Uh, it's been, um, uh, I don't know how many years. There's been a few years randomly in the past where we might have had a few more here or there. But uh, in the recent years, it hasn't been this many. I think there are over 90 uh, with uh, there's counselors uh, and campers. You don't want to know the ratio. Uh, it passes the cancer requirements. But uh, I don't think you'd want to be a counselor. You know what I'm saying? And so what that means, you need to pray for those that are going, don't we? They'll be all right, but there's, uh, I think, uh, 80 or so teenagers and uh, 12 or 14 counselors, something to that effect. So, But you pray for those youngsters that are going that week. That'll be a great opportunity. Uh, we'll do all we can to, to help encourage and support them in that. Uh, with that said, let's have our ushers come tonight. and allow you get back a portion of that, which God's entrusted to you. We uh, also have some other things coming up next week. Next Thursday night is the Primetime Senior Fellowship, and it's birthdays, brides, and blessings. And I think they're going to focus in on kind of celebrating everyone's birthdays and anniversaries and, and such. And so I know uh, Stanley's got a special birthday coming up here before long. He'll be 99. So uh, one way or another, he's got to hit 100. You know what I'm saying? If for some reason God calls him home, we still need to celebrate it next year at that same time, you know. But anyway, a lot of things coming up with the young adult uh, kayak trip, new discipleship class. If you haven't uh, been through that, Brad Hausman's going to teach it for the summer here. Uh, that'll be... Uh, starting Sunday, June the 9th, and then Bible school, uh, kids camp, senior high, junior high camp, still sign up for that as well. Then also make sure before you leave tonight there, that you stop by and get a, a monthly report uh, for the month of May. God really blessed there uh, just all the way around. Uh, there were uh, 16 folks that got saved, uh, eight new members there, and, and financially the Lord just has been continued to be faithful to, to us even in, in all times, so we're thanking the Lord for that. Uh, with that said, let's pray tonight and ask God's blessing. Uh, Brian Edwards, would you pray for us? Continue to worship together. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. For He is good, He is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise. With a mighty hand. And an outstretched arm, his love endures forever. For the life that's been reborn, his love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise. Forever God is faithful, forever God is strong, forever God is 
is with us forever and ever, forever. From the rising to the setting sun, His love endures forever. And by the grace of God, we will carry on. His love endures forever. Sing praise. Sing praise. Sing praise. Sing praise. Forever God is faithful. Forever God. God is with us forever and ever, forever. From heaven's throne you came to us and set your heart upon the cross. We'll never know the sacrifice you've made. For all our sin and all our shame You took the nails, you took our place No one else could do what you have done One name is higher One name is stronger Than any grave, than any throne Christ exalted it over all. From the grave where death would die, you rose again, you brought us life. You're reigning now, the Savior of the world. You're reigning now, the Savior of the world. Messiah, to you alone our praise belongs, Christ exalted over all. We'll sing, we'll sing your praise, we'll sing your praise, we'll sing your praise forever. We lift your name, we lift your name, Jesus over all. We'll sing your praise, we'll sing your praise, we'll sing your praise forever. We lift your name, we lift your name, Jesus over all. One name is higher, one name is stronger than any grave, than any throne. Exalted over all, the only Savior, Jesus Messiah, to you alone our praise belongs, Christ exalted over all, to you alone our praise belongs, Christ exalted over all. If you remain standing, 2 Samuel chapter 19, verse number 1. If you did not get a handout tonight, we're in a new lesson. We're flying right through this. I don't know, just like we started yesterday, but uh, we're in lesson number 10. Uh, they're out there at the Welcome Center table if you want to follow along there, uh, if you don't have the, the folder. But uh, 2 Samuel 19, verse number 1. We've got a few more lessons in this series. And 2 Samuel 19, verse number 1. Read down to verse number 14, and we're looking at David's return to power. Remember that uh, Absalom had the uh, revolution there, and 
and the kind of thrust David out of power for a brief time. But as we left off last time in chapter 18, we see that Absalom was, was slain, and David now is returning back to Jerusalem to assume the, the throne. 2 Samuel 19, verse number 1, we'll find that it wasn't an easy return. Verse 1, it says, And it was told Joab, Behold, the king weepeth and mourneth for Absalom. And the victory that day was turned into mourning unto all the people, for the people heard say that David, uh, um, heard say that, that they, how the king was grieved for his son, and the people got him, them by stealth that day into the city, as people being ashamed steal away when they flee in battle. But the king covered his face, and the king cried with a loud voice, O oh, my son Absalom, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. And Joab came into the house to the king and said, Thou hast shamed this day the faces of all thy servants, which this day have saved thy life and the lives of thy sons and of thy daughters and the lives of thy wives and the lives of thy concubines, and that thou lovest thine enemies and hatest thy friends. For thou hast declared this day that thou regardest neither princes nor servants. For this day I perceive that if Absalom had lived and all we had died this day, then it had pleased thee well. Verse 7, Now therefore rise, go forth, and speak comfortably unto thy servants, for I swear by the Lord, if thou go not forth, there will not tarry one with thee this night, and that will be worse unto thee than all the evil that befell thee from thy youth until now. Verse 8, Then the king arose and sat in the gate, and they told unto all the people, saying, Behold, the king doth sit in the gate, and all the people came before the king, for Israel had fled every man to his tent. And all the people were at strife throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, the king, hath saved, uh, the king saved us out of the hand of our enemies, and he delivered us out of the hand of the Philistines, and now he has fled out of the land for Absalom. And Absalom, whom we anointed over us, is dead in battle. Now therefore, why speak ye not a word of bringing the king back? And King David sent to Zadok and to Abiathar the priest, saying, Speak unto the elders of Judah, saying, Why are ye the last to bring the king back to the house? seeing the speech of all Israel has come to the king, even to his house. Ye are my brethren, ye are my bones and my flesh. Wherefore then are ye the last to bring back the king? And say ye to Amasa, art thou not of my bone and of my flesh? God do so to me, and more also, if thou be not captain of the host before me continually in the room of Joab. And he bowed the heart of all the men of Judah, even as the heart of one man, so that they sent this word unto the king, Return thou and all thy servants. Let's pray this evening and... Uh, Mike Comer, would you pray for us? Amen. You may be seated this evening. Well, we're looking at this lesson on David's return to power. We're looking at shadows of Shiloh. We're seeing pictures in the, the, the leaders there of the United Kingdom of Israel. Remember, uh, we walked through them, Samuel to Saul to David. We'll end up here very soon with the final one we'll look at, and that is Solomon. But we look ahead to Shiloh. Shiloh is the one to whom the kingdom belongs, and uh, we see in each of these leaders that there was some glimpses of, of hope and of promise, but all of them, obviously, we know, would fall short to who Shiloh the ultimate descendant of Judah, the king uh, under David, that one day would rise up and would be the Messiah. Well, we see that this uh, shows us the return of David to Jerusalem. Remember, David's kingdom was on the rise until his sin and murder uh, with both Bathsheba and the murder of her husband. And then things begin to devolve uh, quickly from there. Sin always takes you down a slippery slope and you never see how far it goes. Satan never shows you the end game of sin, does he? He just shows you how enticing it is, the immediate gratification you can get in the moment, but never shows you just how far sin will actually take you. So we see now in this chapter, beginning verse 19, verse 1, over into chapter 21 tonight, we'll see that David returns back to Jerusalem. Remember, he's been thrust out. He's now uh, up in years, and uh, Absalom has uh, led a revolt against him gathered enough following, has uh, you know, hugged enough ladies and kissed, kissed enough babies and sat in the gate and made enough uh, smooth words to be able to gather enough people to follow after him, and then, then they rise up against David. David leaves, and uh, now we know last time as we left off there, there was a, a battle, a, a civil war is really what it was, uh, between the forces of David, led by three different generals, 
uh, Joab notably there, and, um, and, and Abishai and Ittai. And, but uh, David said, don't, don't harm Absalom. And we know that Joab, when he got the opportunity, what did he do? He, he disregarded the king's word, and he, and, he, and he put him to death. When David sadly finds out, you see his response, as we'll note there in chapter 18, verse 33. You know, he says, I, I would have died for thee. And, and when you pick up chapter 19, we begin to see more uh, about that. But tonight I want to look at this thought, and there's a key verse that ties in with this lesson. It's out of 2 Samuel 22, verse 31. It says this, As for God... His way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all them that trust in him. So remember that, that verse tonight. You know, you see that with David, as we'll begin to transition to, from David over to Solomon, that he begins to hand some things down. He begins to pass some things down. Now, oftentimes we think about the hand-me-downs as a second rate. <laughs> and there are times where things maybe that were handed down to you were or in a sense, second rate, and uh, or maybe let's say they they've seen their better days. They've had some wear uh, and tear, and so you you think about that. I know uh, growing up with an older brother and then two younger brothers that um, you know what um, my older brother would wear would 17 months you know younger than him. I would get Josh was so big in short order that it didn't really matter. He probably got some other clothes and things like that, and mom would. Mom would make them. I tell my kids that now, and they just kind of chuckle, you know, that mom made our clothes. And, and uh, so I think Sarah and I should begin making you your clothes. They weren't real fond uh, of that uh, idea, you know. But uh, those hand-me-downs, so to speak, and I think about that. You know, what, what are some things that were handed down to you? And we'll talk more about this maybe when we get into the time of Solomon. But I think the greatest thing that David, and we see, seeks to pass down was what Third John verse 4 tells us. And, and I think what uh, he tells us, he says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. And is there anything for a parent that you would desire any more than that your kids would know the Lord, would love the Lord, and serve the Lord? Isn't that the desire of your heart, amen, as a, as a, as a Christian? And to know that. And so uh, King David passes that spiritual heritage on. We'll talk about that more as we get into the life more of, of Solomon and his reign. But let's look tonight at David's return to Jerusalem. David's return to Jerusalem. If you fill in the blanks there, letter A is preparation for his return Chapter 19 begins to show us there's a preparation for his return. Remember, he descends out of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is up in the mountainous region there in, uh, in Israel. Uh, he descends down into the area near Jericho to the Jordan uh, River. Uh, it was more than 3,000 feet of descent. So they go down, cross over the Jordan River, they go east, and they get out enough uh, away from, from Absalom to be able to create some distance. And God, of course, protected. Uh, God, David used wisdom, human means, but God obviously sovereignly was working on the other end. And there were spies that came, and a lot of people risked their life, and David and his men were spared, and God turned the battle against Absalom, and Absalom, we know, was, was slain. Let's look at this preparation for his return. Chapter 19, we begin to see here, David is mourning the death of Absalom. Uh, he is moved greatly by the loss of his son, uh, Joab. Um, you know, Joab, we'll get to him here soon, but maybe in more detail. Joab's always a very interesting figure, isn't he? You don't know how to take him. There's sometimes you look at him like, man, that guy's got it. You know, he, he maybe seems to show some discernment and make some decisions that other people don't seem to make, but there's other sides of him, and you say, what was he thinking, right? And uh, we'll see ultimately uh, how he ends up. But in the meantime, we see that David is weeping for Absalom. Now, remember what's going on. Absalom has completely turned against David. He's, I mean, if Absalom has his way, he's going to kill his dad. And that's how far this rebellion had gone. This isn't just we're not on speaking terms. <laughs> we're not Facebook friends. <laughs> he, he, he's trying to kill me. He's, he's thrust me off the throne. It's a full uprising. He sexually abused my concubines. He's thrust me out of... Uh, Jerusalem, and we're on the run, and if he has his way, I'm going to die, and all those uh, that are loyal to me are also going to die. And so Absalom was in no way, shape, or form <laughs> the friend of the king. And so David's in a bad way, but you notice that David's heart was still for this rebellious son, wasn't he? He still loved him, and, uh, and, and it was sad to, to really see this story unfold. Maybe there were some reasons why David was so broken over Absalom, 
Uh, we referenced this last time, so I don't mean to be redundant, but number one, I think the first thing you got to think that his son was lost. I mean, you think about the infant child that died, he could bear with his death, not that he could be okay with it, but that he knew he would see him again. Remember 2 Samuel 12, I can't bring him back, but I can go to be with him. And he rested in that eternal promise, but for Absalom, there was no, there was no relief. Uh, Absalom was wicked, rebellious, there was nothing really good in him. I mean, he was sharp, charismatic, good-looking, uh, had a persona about him that could just draw people to him and had some great leadership qualities in some ways, but he had no integrity. He had no character about him. David could not bear the thought of Absalom's death. And then I think, secondly, you, you have to wonder a little bit, maybe David had to think about the fact that Absalom's rebellion was for some of David's own misgivings, that David sinned with uh, Bathsheba, David's uh, a murder of Uriah, uh, David's uh, inactivity at times as a father, his inactivity at times as a king where he didn't move uh, to act against other um, injustices that went on in the family, in the kingdom. And so maybe there's some sense of remorse that was there. But at this point, you continue from chapter 18, 33, when David is saying, would to God I had died for thee. You come over to chapter 19, and, and David just is inconsolable here. I, I mean, it's as though he throws himself across the bed and he sets aside all his kingly duties and he's done. He, you just put a fork in him. He's, he's done. He's lost his son. He's weeping. He's mourning. He, he doesn't even think about the thought that the kingdom has been brought back to him or could be brought back to him. He doesn't think that the civil war has now come to a cessation. All he can think about is, I have a son that is lost and is dead. And this is just overwhelming him. And he has forgot every other responsibility he has. And I think sometimes as we look at this story tonight, I, again, I, I'm reading through these three chapters today and trying to, I told Brother Jerry, I said, these, these are hard sometimes to teach through this, so bear with me. You know, it's hard to kind of teach through a couple of chapters, and so I don't mean to go too slow through this, but there's a lot to learn. And listen, I want to learn from their lives, amen. I don't want to go through any unnecessary pain other than what I bring upon myself, but I want to learn from them. So Joab comes here, and Joab was the one who obviously took the life of Absalom against the word of the king, and he just bluntly tells David these words, you know, he says, uh, it, it would seem that if uh, Absalom lived and we all had died, you would have been okay with that. You could have lost your entire kingdom, and that one rebellious boy would have lived and you'd have been okay. But now what have you done? You love your enemy, and you hate your friends. And he just spoke very bluntly to him. I mean, he, here's a, a weeping, mourning king, and yet Joab comes and he speaks very directly. But you got to understand, though, at the same time, what he was speaking, because he says here, if you don't come and restore things and, 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 and make things right, because when the people saw the king mourning, they fled to their tents, you know, as though they were kind of like the, the children in trouble, so to speak, and they're all fleeing and, and running and and uh, he says, you're going to lose more than just your son. You're going to lose all your family. You're going to lose all your kingdom. You're going to lose all your might and dominion. And so Joab speaks these very harsh words. And, and it takes this to kind of jolt David back to reality. You know, sometimes if we're not careful, we can fall into the same category as David. Not that we aren't in the same boat always. Maybe some of you have in life been at these kind of times where you have this kind of Loss, but there came a point in time where he needed to be reminded that he was still alive and he was still the king and he still had a kingdom and he still had a family and he saw other children and he had other reasons to live and his life wasn't over. And so Joab had to speak some harsh words because it was come to the place where if he didn't make some action, then things were going to quickly descend into peril for everyone here, as Joab very bluntly. Uh, declares. I'm reminded of what Proverbs 27 verse 6 says, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. You know, I'm sure if David was on Facebook then, everybody would have been posting those little heart emojis and tear emojis and we love you, uh, David, and you just take all the time that you need. But you also got to realize the kingdom was about ready to splinter in a lot of different ways. And we'll see shortly, there's already another uprising with Sheba coming to take the the kingdom for himself. He, he was not in a position where he could have just stopped living. 
And uh, I think it's important to remember that. You know, there's a time to weep, isn't there? There's a time to mourn, Ecclesiastes tells us. There's also a time to plant, and there's also a time to sow. There's a time to refrain from, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing. It's right to mourn, but at the same time, it's also not right to lose the kingdom or to lose touch with reality. You know, I think sometimes we're not careful. We can lose touch with what would Christ want for my life? What would even that believer want for my life? I think about uh, just the last funeral I did just a few weeks ago uh, with Amy Fogel's passing. And, you know, she had said very clearly she would love to see someone come to faith in Christ at her funeral. And, and she clearly articulated to family, friends, others, uh, what her desires were for her heart. And I think about that, and a lot of times as a pastor, you get to see both sides. You get to see before, during, and after. And there's sometimes I wonder, and it grieves my heart, because sometimes it, it works out well where the desire of the person's heart is for you to know, love, and serve Christ, and then you get to see after that person is gone, those people doing that. And there's a sense there where you've honored them, you've esteemed them, you've, you've rewarded what their desire was. But there's also a side where they've wanted something for you, you've even promised something to them, and you're not keeping your end of the bargain. And that's a shame. There comes a point in time where as much as we want to weep and as much as we want to mourn, we, like David, we cannot, we cannot live that way forever. We have to weep, we have to mourn, we have to take that time. But I like what my grandma Bevan said, <laughs> life is for the living. If God wanted to take you home, he would have taken you home. In the meantime, you need to look around you and realize you're not the only one. You have family, you have a spouse, you have children, you have grandchildren, you got neighbors, you got a church family, and you just cannot stop living. And I think David, if you'd have left David here, his kingdom would have been gone. <laughs> Had Job not spoken those harsh words, do you think Job wanted to say those words? No. Do you think David wanted to hear those words? No. But it was the best thing at that season. There's a time to say those words, and there's a time not to, but when we, when we say those, we, we need to you know, say them with the right heart, we need to receive them. In the right heart and I think what we learn from David here is mourn and weep but you can't live in that state forever and God God wouldn't want that Christ wouldn't want that and we need to realize especially if we have a believing loved one who's going on that uh, listen they're in God's hands and we rest in that we rest that they're in God's hands and what better hands would they would you want them to be in amen you trust the doctor's hands more you trust your hands more I trust God's hands the most and if God saw fit at that time and season to bring them home, listen, they're, they're, they're in a better place than you. To be honest with you, I'm jealous of them. I mean, you think about where they're at, and you think about where we're at. Where would you rather be? I mean, think about it, Christian. Do we really believe heaven is what the Bible describes it as? And if it is what it says it is, and we get to go to be with them evermore, we need, we need to rest in that to, to, to a sense as well. We mourn, but there is a time to arise, wash your face, and go on serving because there are still others all around us. And I think the thing that we need to realize, I think is really important in this, is to know what the Spirit of God would be leading you to do and what Satan would want you to do. How can constant remorse over sin and its consequences keep a believer from being used effectively again by God? You know, maybe David is here and, and he's carrying the personal weight, the personal guilt, and, and he's asking the, the thousand and one questions, what if... What if I had not committed adultery? What if I had not been involved in that murder? What if I had dealt judicially different with the wayward son uh, to begin with? H how if I could have handled this situation differently would things maybe have turned out differently? Well, let's remind ourselves of, of two key thoughts tonight. It can be hard sometimes because if we're not careful, we can stay in these positions too long. To not move beyond remorse is to thwart the forgiving and sanctifying work of God. This can be hard sometimes, but remember the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin in order that we would repent, confess, and find renewal. On the other hand, Satan guilts us to believe we can never be used again, that we are too far gone. Think about the desire, the end game. Um, sometimes it can be hard to discern between conviction and between guilt. Satan guilts us to bring us down, to keep us in those states of not being used. The Holy Spirit convicts or convinces us 
of the right way to go, of what we're not doing, that we might go on and find renewal. He convicts us for ultimate service to God. Satan, on the other hand, wants to condemn us, weigh us down, beat us down, remind us of all of our failures. I'm just give you two passages just to drive this home. Revelation 12, verse 9 to 11. So which voice are we listening to? Do we listen to the Holy Spirit who says this is wrong? <laughs> This is the right way, now go the right way, and we address that sin in our lives, and we confess it, we turn from it, and then we move on, and there's confession, and there's healing, and there's renewal, and there's uh, a new path before us. On the other hand, Satan wants to constantly bring up our past, constantly bring up that which we've been forgiven of. You know the passage, Revelation 12, verse number 9, um, Satan is obviously the accuser of the brethren, he's called the great dragon, serpent, devil, Satan, deceives the whole world. Down in verse number 10, it goes on to say, uh, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the what? Power of his Christ for the what? Accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them. Listen, if he's in heaven for a limited time accusing believers before God, you can be assured that he and his demonic horde are doing all they can to accuse your spirit that you are guilty and you cannot be used. And he's accusing us before God day and night. What arrogance, right, to do that before God. How much more would he do it to you and I? Verse 11, though, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Uh, look at one other. I, I think this is a very good passage, one we don't look at often. But Zechariah chapter 3, verse number 1 Zechariah chapter 3, verse number 1, says, And he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord. And notice, and Satan standing at his what? Right hand to what? To resist him. And verse 2, uh, And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan, even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked? I like this thought, this image, uh, plucked out of the fire, that God has reached down and, and plucked us out of the fire. Verse number 3, now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments. It's not that Satan doesn't have reason to accuse us, amen. We all have filthy garments in our lives, right? And, and it says, and, and stood before the angel, but verse number four, and the answer was spoken to those that stood before him, saying, take away the filthy garments from him. Listen, the, the difference is this. It's not that you haven't said, thought, and done things in life that are worthy of being condemned by somebody, notably Satan. <laughs> but the difference is, is when you come to Christ, and you confess and you repent of that, God takes that old filthy garment off of you and he puts a clean garment on you. And so you're not standing in who you are. You're not standing in how clean your speech or thoughts and things of that matter are, but in your forgiveness and redemption that is found through Christ. He says, and unto him, he said, behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee and I will clothe thee with the change of raiment. And, uh, and I said, let the fair minor be put upon his head, and he, and he changed the, the garments out of there. So remember, Satan wants to point out the filth on your garment, but you just need to remind him, you don't wear that garment anymore. Amen? I always like the thought that Satan reminds you of your past, you remind him of his future. Amen? That you think about what you've done in life, and yeah, you've got filth on your garment, and, uh, and he can even use people in the world to remind you. Now, let me say that if there's things you need to confess, confess them. If there's people you need to apologize to, it, it doesn't exempt you uh, from just blowing that off or, or snubbing your nose at somebody. You wrong somebody, you need to go make that right, amen? You lie to somebody, you need to go be honest and rectify that. You've wronged somebody financially, you need to go make that thing right. You need to be a good, upright Christian and citizen in, in all ways. But when you've done all you can do and you confess it to God, you made yourself right before God and men, what did Paul say? He said, I always live my life to have a, 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 a conscience void of offense before God and before men. And if you can live your life saying, I'm going to be right with God and right with men, you can sleep easy at night. And that's, that's how I want to try to live. And I'm trying more and more to say, I just want to live that I don't have anything between God and I vertically, nor do I have anything between me and someone else horizontally. Because that's just no way to live. It will, it will dry you up like a prune. And you can act that something's not wrong, but you know better than I do. And so coming back to this thought, tonight, who are you listening to? The Holy Spirit who convinces you that something is wrong and you need to make that right, you need to move beyond that, or are you listening to Satan who just wants to keep bringing up your past? If it's under the blood and you've confessed it, you've made it right with God and men, you need to move on. You need to move on. And whatever that means for you, if you've got to take a piece of paper and 
and uh, burn that in the fire as a symbol that you are moved on beyond that, then you do that. Whatever it takes that you move beyond your past, don't let Satan let you live in a spirit of, uh, of remorse and a spirit that you don't move beyond that. Listen, God's not waiting for perfect people because there are none of them. Amen. We wouldn't any of us be here tonight if God only waited for perfect, perfect people to be used. Well, we continue on in these verses and we see that confusion begins to abound uh, in the uh, government of Israel. The northern tribes and the southern tribes begin to battle. And this has been kind of a, a subtle thing. Uh, the ten northern tribes, the two southern tribes of Judah, the ten northern tribes as we know them more specifically soon as Israel. Israel was quick to recall David as king. Judah was slow to recall David. And David moves in a strategic way in these verses to appoint Amasa, Absalom's former captain, to replace Joab. David, obviously at this point, receives a quick invitation to return as king. Here we find that David comes back in over the Jordan River. We pick up verse number 15. Notice there. It says, So the king returned and came to Jordan and Judah came to Gilgal to go to meet the king to conduct the king over Jordan. Now, who's going to meet him, all right? He's going out in a far country. People treated him one way. Now he's coming home, and who's going to be there to greet him? Well, verse number 16, And Shimei, the son of Gera, a Benjamite, which was a Baharim, hasted and came down with the men of Judah to meet King David. And uh, you read on down, and others come to meet him. And, and Ziba's mentioned there, verse 17 and verse 18, And there went out a ferry boat to carry over the king's household and do what he thought good. And Shimei, the son of Gera, fell down before the king as he was come over Jordan. Now this Shimei character, he's quite a, he's quite a character. And he? he's the same guy back in chapter 16 that when David and his men come out, what does he do? He comes out and he calls him a bloody man. He calls him all these things. He's cursing him. He calls him a son of Belial, uh, throwing dust and throwing stones. And remember Abishai says, David, can I go take his head off? You know, I mean, that, 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 that's those judicial sons of uh, uh, of David's family member there. And so David says, no, let, let, him, let him be, let him curse. But now notice when David is in power, what does he do? He returns in a very different disposition. You see, Shimei comes out to meet him. Shimei curses him when he's down and he can't help Shimei. But now he's praising him when he's up and he can help Shimei. You see, he wasn't too concerned when David looked weak. But all of a sudden when David's back in power, man, he's right he's he's all the concerned and you know now he's asking for uh, forgiveness and you say well maybe it was sincere well we don't know we're going to find out shortly how sincere it was and uh, David for that time did not uh, allow him to be put to death even though uh, yet again Abishai wants to kill him again over in verse 21 and, and verse number 22 and, uh, and, and verse 23 the king said unto Shimei thou shalt not die so David's coming back he's not wanting more bloodshed He's wanting peace. And uh, then we see verse 24, Mephibosheth is the second one mentioned. in verse 23, who meets him next? Mephibosheth. Who was Mephibosheth? He was the lame son of Jonathan, remember? And uh, he, had, uh, with the nurse there when he was young, had fallen and, and uh, was lame upon his feet. And remember that uh, David, for the sake of Jonathan, called Mephibosheth to be like a son unto him to bring him into the king's palace, to let him feed at his table, and to basically be treated as such. Well, remember back last time, I'm going to take time to look at all these parallel passages, but you'll find back in, in, in 2 Samuel, just a few chapters back, that when David is leaving Jerusalem, Ziba, who was there to take care of Mephibosheth, fled and met up with David and uh, told David that Mephibosheth, he lied, he deceived David about Mephibosheth, and he said, yes, he's looking at this as an opportunity to, to restore some glory. Well, Ziba, you say, well, who was right or who was wrong? Ziba, obviously, it doesn't appear as you begin to read all this together, seems to be the one that was in the right, because as you'll note, just notice the, the attitude and the actions of Mephibosheth. It seemed that Ziba was one, like many other times, that was trying to find favor with the king. Here's my chance throw off the, the servitude to Mephibosheth. Uh, here's my chance. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get in favor with the, the king. And how does Mephibosheth respond? He says here in verse 24, Mephibosheth, the son of Saul, came down to meet the king. And he, notice how he had been since King David had left. Now, do you think if he was trying to retain some former glory <laughs> that he would respond to this way? That he had not dressed 
his feet, nor trimmed his beard, nor washed his clothes from the day that David left. You read on down. He said, why didn't you go with me? He said, my master deceived me, Ziba. He fled, and he said, you know, uh, your servant here is lame. Um, he slandered me to you. And uh, he says, you, king, are like an angel before God. And, and uh, he says, you know, you, you treated me better than I deserve. Verse 28, verse 29, he says, what, why speakest thou anymore? And verse 29, David says, you divide the, the land. And Mephibosheth says something, says something in verse 30. Yea, let him take all, for as much as my lord the king has come again in peace on his own house. It seems to be that Mephibosheth was deceived. Ziba left him. He was lame, couldn't do much about it. And now he's been in basically just waiting for opportunity to be restored to the king. And, uh, and uh, David doesn't know who's right or wrong here. He seems to just want to pacify the situation. And he divides the land that was left from Saul unto them. And uh, Mephibosheth said, let him have it all. So you begin to see Mephibosheth's heart doesn't seem to be he's trying to retain some former glory. And, uh, and so we note that tonight about him. And then notice something else, verse 31 to 40, about Barzillai. I'll just reference these. I won't take the time to read all these verses. But Barzillai, remember in chapter 17, verse 27 to 29, was one of the, 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 the wealthy benefactors that helped David. David's fleeing with his men. They're running from Absalom. You, they, they cross over Jordan, and Barzillai and others are there to bring them beds and food and all sorts of uh, goodies and butter or peanut butter, Jif, right? I said that last time, and then the next service I showed up, I had a can of Jif peanut butter. So I either thought someone wants to kill the preacher with salmonella or they love the preacher with, uh, with Jif, all right? Uh, I did find some of the other offshoots like the peanut peter pan or some i mean just like at the top i mean if you like peanut butter jiff is at the top miles out there like me just i mean it is at the top you can afford it all right it's one of those great luxuries in life but now you're trying to save so you got to go to the offshoots you know uh you so i didn't know there was a difference well you don't know peanut butter there's a few things in life i really peanut butter is the one of them you know we might be swimming it in heaven but uh but there was that it doesn't mention butter there it doesn't say jiff it doesn't say peanut butter but but barzillai was one who blessed the king now i think it's important to note here about Barzillai, that his blessing to the king, and he didn't do it for that reason, but he blessed the king in a time of need. And now when you come full circle, what does the king do? The king's blessing Barzillai. But notice something here in verse 37. I thought some of you folks could relate tonight. Uh, uh, verse, verse number 34. I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. I thought some of the seasoned folks could relate tonight. Uh, King David says, come with me, you know, come into Jerusalem, come eat at my table, and that kind of thing. Verse 34, Barzillai said unto the king, how long have I to live? Let's see if you're listening tonight. That I should go up with the king of the Jerusalem. I am this day four score years old. Am I listening? And can I discern between good and evil? Can thy servant taste what I eat or what I drink? Anybody? Can I hear any more the voice of singing men and singing women? I'm, you're, you know, I'm, I'm poking you, but I'm working that way too, all right? Wherefore then should thy servant be yet a burden unto my Lord the King? What was he saying? He said, I'm, I'm 80 years old. Uh, you know, me going and leaving and, and starting all over, that's just not where I'm at. But notice what he says, and, and he goes on down, verse 37, and the, and the king understands. He says, Let thy servant, I pray thee, turn back again, that I may die in mine own city and be buried by the grave of my father and of my mother. Notice this, but behold thy servant, Chimham. Let him go over with my lord the king and do to him what shall seem good unto thee. You know what he does? He, he does the same thing that what happened with Jonathan and Mephibosheth. David had no affinity for Mephibosheth, but David loved Jonathan. And David told Jonathan they had an agreement and a pact. And for Jonathan's sake, he was going to treat his offspring well. And David loved Mephibosheth. And David brought Mephibosheth before the king as a lame cripple to be a son unto him to sit at his table, to be cared for all the days of his life, not for Mephibosheth's sake, but for Jonathan's sake. And now what we're going to find is David brings Chimham to the palace with the king to be as a son, to be taken care of, to live in the palace life, not because Chimham's anything, but because Chimham had a man who cared for him. And very likely, some, some even indicate that this was his son, Barzillai blessed the king because of Barzillai's faithfulness, God blessed his son and servant, Chimham. And you see, you and I are the same way. People say, well, you think you're better than me, or you, you're going to heaven because you're a good person. That's got nothing to do with any of us tonight. God loved us for the sake of Jesus Christ. 
Ephesians 4, 32, God forgave us, not for anything we've done, but for Christ's sake, we are forgiven. And we see that tonight. Don't take to heart too much the old folks joke because that's for all of us, all right? Uh, we go on to see that there's further strife that's uh, unfolding there as Israel's fighting for access to the king and, and Judah's fighting to claim uh, ac more access to the king as blood uh, with David. And you notice uh, Proverbs 13, 10, only by pride cometh contention, but with the well-advised is wisdom. You know, when there's pride, there's contention. And Israel and Judah both had a spirit of pride about David, and they both were vying for him, and that pride brought contention. And it really leads to this next chapter, chapter 20, beginning in verse number 1. You'll see that Sheba seizes a hold of this kind of contention. And uh, it says there, you see when there's uh, this spirit of pride and the spirit of uh, instability, you'll see opportunists like Sheba rise up to the top and he's looking for this opportunity. He's not looking to glorify God. He's looking to glorify Sheba. And it says there he was a man of Belial. He was a wicked man, a rebellious man, a worthless man. And uh, he blew a trumpet. We have no part in David. Every man in his tent. And you read on down, you begin to see that he gathers the people of Israel together and they leave out and they begin to turn against him. Now at this point, David has replaced Joab as the general. And down in verse number four, he tells Amasa to assemble him within three days, the soldiers to go and to fight and uh, restore the kingdom because now we're divided yet again. And Amasa delays. And I think about this Amasa figure for a moment. He delayed getting the soldiers ready when the time that the king had decreed had come. David appointed him a time and Amasa was slow to gather these soldiers together, and as a result, verse number six, David says, Now Sheba's going to set fenced cities, and they're going to set against me, and it's going to be even worse than what it had or, or could have been. And so now uh, he calls Abishai to go. Amasa delayed obeying the king. And he said, What was the reason for this? Was it his lack of gifting? Uh, was he maybe wasn't fully knit with David's heart? Was he wanting this? Rebellion to, to work against David? We don't fully know. I'll just say this. Amasa delayed his obedience. He was procrastinating. And remember something, dear friend. Maybe Wednesday night's not the place to say it, but, but please know that no one ever served God tomorrow. No one ever served God tomorrow. You serve God today. You, you act and you do and you move to serve the Lord today. Because so when I get everything ready, I get my things in order and life eases up a little bit, then I'll serve God. No, 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 no. You're boasting. That, that's called presumption. It's a sin of presumption. James chapter 4, 13 to 17 says, well, I'll serve God when I... No, no, no. Right now is the time you have. Boast not of tomorrow. No one serve God doing anything tomorrow. Serve God right now. Don't delay like a mass. And it ends up costing him, obviously, dearly, Joab was going to take the opportunity, and uh, they go out to battle. You know the story here, and, and, uh, and Amasa is delayed. He ends up catching up. He's wearing Joab's uh, garments that seem to not fit him just right. His sword falls out. Joab does third time what he has always been doing. He had murdered Abner, the general. He had murdered Absalom, the son of the king, and now he murders uh, Amasa, the general that David had appointed. Well, you know the story they move his body aside. They go after Sheba. They come to the, 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 the area of Abel, the city or village, if you will, of Abel. And uh, the people there say, look, don't, uh, don't destroy the city, Joab. What do you want? They said, give us the, this one figure. Give us this Sheba. Throw his head over and we will be at peace with you. And you read on down and they do just that. And peace is called and they restore the city uh, back. Let's look at one last thing in chapter 21. And and uh, so we see uh, letter B was the suppression of Sheba's revolt. The su suppression of Sh Sheba's revolt. The last thing we'll see at letter C is famine and wars with the Philistines. Famine and wars with the Philistines. There's this famine that comes. You remember something that God had told them, if you obey me, then I will bless you. If you disobey me, then you will be chastised. Well, they come to this place in chapter 21 where a famine sets in. And it doesn't elaborate at first why the famine has come. And so David goes to verse number one and he inquires of the Lord. And God says, it's for Saul and for his bloody house because he slew the Gibeonites. He slew the Gibeonites. And we find, dear friend, that he had slain the 
Gibeonites, and they were the ones that, of course, going way back to Joshua chapter 9, that they were to protect and preserve, and, uh, and the unjust act, the innocent blood that was shed, God took note of, and let us always remember that, dear friend. Listen, years can pass, and innocent bloodshed, God is still taking note of. So these 63 million babies that have been slaughtered, you think, you think God's not noticing? <laughs> if anything, he's noticing that all the more. And how much more should our land be facing judgments of all sorts? Famine and wars come with the Philistines. There's famine that goes on, and basically God uh, is inquired of by David. David then goes to the Gibeonites and says, What must I do to reconcile with you? And they wanted seven sons of uh, Saul to be hung up. They gather all, uh, or seven sons, uh, exemption of Mephibosheth. They hang them up, and they're there for longer time than what uh, Deuteronomy 21 says that they should have been. It should have just been for that one day. Uh, those that were cursed should have been hung up. But it was a seeming an, an act of vengeance by the Gibeonites. Um, it also, uh, they buried those, their bodies after a, a period of time. Um, and then it says down in verse 14, and after that, God was entreated for the land. And and so then the land obviously was uh, restored. Let's look at this last thought. I think we look at uh, these final giants. You know, we always think about Goliath as being the one giant that's notable in the Scripture. But as we close out chapter 22 tonight, I want you to see that there were four other giants of note. You begin to read their names, and they're hard to pronounce. But in verse number 15, it says, Moreover, the Philistines had yet war again with Israel, and David went down and his servants with him and fought against the Philistines, and David waxed faint. Now, David's up in years at this point. Uh, we know minimally he's well over 50. He's probably you know, beyond that by a number of years. I think if I'm not mistaken, uh, don't crucify me at the door. I think he lives to be 70, so he's somewhere between 50 and 70. I think he's probably closer to the, the upper number there. But verse 16, he's still out in battle. Can you imagine going out and fighting a giant? Well up in years, let's put it that way. And uh, it says, And Ishbi Binab, which was of the sons of the giant, the weight of whose spear weighed 300 shekels of brass and weight, he being girded with a new sword, thought to have slain David. Uh, he's about to kill the king. But Abishai goes and conquers him. And they say to David, Your time for battling is over. Thou shalt go no more out with us to battle, that thou quench not the light of Israel. And there's a time to lead and a time to let others lead. Amen. There's a time to, to draw the sword in this sense and uh, other times to let those that are young and, and youthful to, to do that very thing. And But then notice you read on about other giants that are, that are closed out in this chapter, verse 18. And it came to pass after this that there was again a battle with the Philistines at Gob and Sibachai the Hushathite slew Saph, which was of the sons of the giant. And there was again a battle in Gob with the Philistines where El Hanan, the son of Jero, Regim, a Bethlehemite, slew the brother of Goliath, the Gittite, the staff of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. And there was yet a battle in Gath, where was a man of, this isn't out of Princess Bride, this is probably where they got it from, though, had on his hand every one six fingers, and every, you killed my father, prepared to die, right? And on every foot, six toes, four and twenty, I'm, I'm, I'm dating myself here. And he also was born to the giant. And when he defied Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shimea, the brother of David, slew him. These four were born of the giant in Gath and fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. You look here, and if you look at these and you compare with Goliath, there were five Philistine giants that are of note. It's interesting then that David fought a giant early in his life, and now later in life, he still, he and or his people are still facing these giants. You know, there are times in your life where there are giants that come and you may conquer them by faith and trust and by, by God's decree and by God's word. But it doesn't mean that those giants won't creep back up. And they won't come back and tell you you're not good enough and you're, you're, they're going to conquer you yet again. And you can't let that come in your life. If God's given you the victory, you need to overcome. Giants are not always a one and done. They were there, they are there, and they will be there in the future. We need to walk in faith and trust in God and leave you with this last thing, 1 Samuel 17, verse number 39. 1 Samuel 17, 39. Look at what it says here. It's very good. And David, this is going back to when he fought Goliath. And David girded his sword upon his arm, and he said to go, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, right? I can't wear your armor, for I have not proved them. And David put them off him. But notice verse 40. And he took his 
staff in his hand, and he chose him how many? Five smooth stones out of the brook, and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had even in a scrip, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. Now, ask yourself a question, right? Do you really think that David, who went to fight Goliath, nine feet, nine inches, all this massive armor, huge giant, been a warrior for years and years, David just a, a teenager at this point, do you really think David had enough faith to go fight the giant, but thought he was going to need five stones? I, I really don't think you could look at that and say, there's no reason to think he'd bring five stones because he thought, oh, God didn't direct that one, God didn't direct that. I don't think he had any thought of that whatsoever. I can't say for certainty, but you have to wonder if he was thinking about the other four giants that might have been coming out against him yet to battle. And he thought, I'm going to take this one down, and the four of you want some? I got four more stones for you. You know what I'm saying? Because you read on later, and through him and or his soldiers, by the time that his reign is over, they've slain all five of those giants. Can I say to you, carry more than one stone. Not because you don't trust God, but because there's other giants that are going to creep up in your future. And whether it's you or family or others around you or other servants of the Lord, they need to go down. Amen. They don't need to stop us from serving the Lord. Would you stand with me tonight as you stand and bow your heads and close your eyes? Maybe you want to go out tonight and carry your five stones. Put them in your purse. Put them in your vehicle. Put them in a place where you study God's word. And you need to remember that maybe you've used one of them or used a couple of them. But you've got a few more yet, yet to use tonight. Maybe tonight God has spoken to you. I know we've just kind of read and studied and, and applied some of these things. And maybe tonight you realize uh, you've been carrying some remorse too long. You've been allowing Satan to convince you that you're not good and that you can't be used and you can't get past whatever it is that's been keeping you in this quagmire. Uh, you're stuck and you can't move beyond it. Listen, that's not where God would have you. God wants you to move forward. God wants you to advance. And there's a season and a time to, to catch your breath, but you can't live in that season. And maybe God tonight is just prodding you onward. Maybe it's a, a word from Joab tonight. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Maybe tonight God has spoken to you and his Holy Spirit is convincing you to make something right with him or with others. If God has dealt to you, with you in that regard, would you come tonight? And maybe tonight as you look at this story and you see the pride that brings contention, maybe there's pride in our hearts. Maybe tonight you look and there's some giants facing us down, staring us down, telling us that we're not worthy to be used. God will enable us to conquer those before us. Lord, bless this invitation time. I pray for anyone tonight that doesn't know you, that tonight would be the night. For any Christian that needs to come and bring a burden to you, whatever it is that's telling us, Lord, that we can't serve you, that we can't get past the sin that we're struggling with or can't get past some hurt in our lives, God, give us the strength, the promise to move beyond these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you come tonight as we sing? Would you come as we sing and others pray? Would you come? The splendor of the King Clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice trembles at his voice how great is our god sing with me how great is our god and all will see how great how great is our time to pray. If you need to come tonight for any reason, there are folks that would pray with you. If you just need to come bring a burden to the Lord, whatever it is, would you come tonight? Would you come? Age to age he stands and time is in his hands beginning and the end beginning and the end the God had three in one the father spirit son the lion and the lamb the lion and the lamb how great is our God 
Sing with me how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. All God's people said, amen. Well, it's been good to be with you tonight. Uh, I don't know what the giants in your life, I know for me many times it's, uh, it's fear, you know, fear of failure or fear of uh, letting the Lord down and, and things like that. I know uh, when God called us to come to Chillicothe to plant the church, it was fear that kept me back. I didn't want to fail the Lord, you know. I didn't want to, what if it doesn't make it? What if I fail? And, and I, don't, I don't want to do that for the Lord, but it's like it's failure either way, right? If I don't go, that's failure, right? But God calls you to do something, and we need to take that step and leave it all, all with the Lord. And if God's going to call us something, he's going to equip us, amen? So if God's called you to do something, He'll empower you. So let's close out tonight with a word of prayer. Ask God's blessing as we go from this place tonight. Uh, Gene Skaggs could I ask you to pray for us.